2 Kings chapter 5 in your Schofield Reference Bible, page 426. We'll begin with verse 10, read through verse 14. The verses we'll be reading responsively. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse, verses 10 through 14, page 426. Let's stand, please, for the reading of God's word. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth, and went away, and said, Behold, I thought, he will surely come out to me, and stand, and call on the name of the Lord his God, and strike his hand over the place, and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then, when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God and all all of his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold now, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, Take a blessing of thy servant. Let's pray. Father, we thank thee for this day. Thank you for your word. Bless now as we hear it, and bless our preacher in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I'll be brief. I want to speak to you on the subject, God is waiting on you, the next move is yours. God is waiting on you, the next move is yours. Our Heavenly Father, bless, I pray, the message from God, from the Word of God, By, I pray, the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, if you'll listen carefully, everybody focus your eyes right here as we, just for a few minutes, bring the message of life. Let me, let me, let you eavesdrop on a conversation I had recently on an airplane with a very wealthy lady. Would you have a seat across the aisle? For a few moments, and would you listen to us as we talk? I'm sitting there reading my Bible and making some notes on a piece of paper as I do. And she looks over and she, she asks, You must be a minister, sir. Are you a minister? And I said, I'm pastor of the First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. She said, are you preparing a sermon? And I said, as a matter of fact, I am sort of brushing over one and, and, and adding a few thoughts to one, or I'll speak tonight. She said, where are you speaking tonight? And I said, I'm speaking at a university, on the campus of a university, at a, at a convention, um, a big convention that was leasing the the Colosseum of the campus of that university. And I asked, ma'am, could I ask you, you, where do you go to church? And she told me, she lived in the east, uh, I forget what city it was, but Boston or New York or Philadelphia, somewhere out east. And she said, uh, I go to church, and she told me the church. I would not help the sermon if I told you what the church was. But I said, I asked her, ma'am, could I ask you a question? If you, do you know that if you died at this moment, you'd go to heaven? And she said, well, I cannot be sure about that. I don't think anybody can be sure to you. And I asked or said, yes, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye might know that ye have eternal life. And I said, yes, ma'am, there's a way that you can know that you could go to heaven if you died at this moment. She replied, well, (laughs) uh, 
I didn't know that, and I said, let me ask you this, ma'am. I was sitting on her left, looking this way, and I said, if I could show you in the Bible how if you died today, you'd go to heaven, would you be willing to do what the Bible says? Well, she said, uh, uh, if I could see it in the Bible, uh, I'm sure I would, but <coughs> she said, uh, uh, well, what, what is it? And I told her very briefly, I said, in the first place, there are four things you have to know to go to heaven when you die. The first thing you have to know is that you're a sinner. The Bible says in Romans 3.10, there's none righteous, no, not one. In Romans 3.23, for all is sin and come short of the glory of God. And the Bible says that wherefore is by uh, uh, one man's sin entered into the world, Romans 5, 12, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all is sin. I said the second thing you have to know is that there's a price on sin. Now, first thing, all of us are sinners. Second thing, there's a price on sin. And uh, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I said the third thing you have to know, <laughs> not only that you're a sinner, and that sinners are lost and must pay the price. But the third thing is that Jesus has already paid the price for us. Romans 5, 8, But God committed His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I said the fourth thing you have to know is that if you would believe in Christ as your Savior, relying upon His payment for your sins as your hope for heaven, you could know that if you died, you'd go to heaven. She said, but sir, what church would I have to join? And I said, you wouldn't have to join any church. But she said, what form of baptism would be necessary? And I said, there would not be any form of baptism necessary. But she said, what ritual or sacrament would I have to perform? And I said, you wouldn't have to perform any sacrament or ritual at all. She said, but there wouldn't be any good deeds I'd have to do. I said, no, ma'am. I said, all you have to do is receive Christ relying upon Him as your Savior. When you do that, God makes you a new person. Then you want to go to church. Then you want to get baptized. Then you want to do good deeds. But you're saved not by your deeds, not by your merit, not by your church, not by your communion, not by your sacraments, but by your personal acceptance of Jesus Christ into your heart. Then she said something. <laughs> she said, when he gets ready for me, Reverend, I'll know. I'll know when my time has come. And I looked at her and I said, I think that's true. And I've got some good news for you. I said, your time has come. And she said, how do you know my time has come? I don't feel anything. How do you know? And I said, because I've done my part. She said, you've done what? I said, I've done my part. Well, she said, what do you mean? I said, lady, there are three, three necessary people who must do their parts before anybody can go to heaven and know it. One, I must do my part. I must give you the facts. Two, you must do your part. You must provide the faith. Three, God must do his part. He provides the feeling or the salvation. First, the facts. Now, I said, you won't feel it until you put your faith in Christ. You don't, you don't hurt and then sit on attack. You sit on attack and then hurt. Uh, you don't, uh, you don't uh, uh, tingle and then uh, kiss your uh, bride. You kiss your bride and then you tingle. And, uh, and I said, the first you've got to know the facts. And I've told you the facts. Now I said, secondly, you've got to put your faith in Christ. And I said, I'll guarantee you, when I've done my part and you've done your part, God will do his part. She said, I don't understand that. And I said, listen carefully. And I'll explain it to you. I said, once there was a nation, and that nation had two or three or three and a half million people. And they were they left the land of Egypt where they had been in bondage, and the entire nation of Israel was marching toward the promised land. But I said, they came. I was talking to her all the time. And, uh, and uh, I said, they came to a great body of water known as the Red Sea. Now, they could not, there, there were no bridges over which to cross. <laughs> they had no, no ferry boats. They had no way to get across. And behind them came the armies of Egypt to kill them. And I said, guess what God did? God parted that Red Sea and let those Israelites, two or three or four million of them, walk across on dry ground. And then 
after they got across, the Egyptian army came on that dry ground, and God brought the sea back up, and the Egyptian army was destroyed, and God's people were saved. But, I said, God didn't do it till Moses got the rod and smote the Red Sea with the rod. And I said, that Red Sea would not have been smitten or parted to this day if Moses had not done his part. You see, God said to Moses, I'd like to part that Red Sea, but uh, I'm waiting on you. Next move is yours. And so man did his part, and God, in response to that, did his part. I said one time, lady, there was a, a time where 5,000 men plus the women and children and any time you got 5,000 men, you got 5,000 women. Any time you got 5,000 men and women, you got 10,000 children. In First Baptist Church, 40 or 50,000 of them. But uh, they came to the to the red to, 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 to time to eat, and it was noon and time to eat, and they were hungry. And you know what Jesus did? I was talking to her all this time. I said Jesus fed 5,000 people. He didn't cater it from McDonald's. He didn't bring pizza in from Pizza Hut. I said, he fed those 5,000 people miraculously. She said, I heard about that story. But I said, he did it because one little boy did his part. One little boy brought his loaves and fishes and gave his little basket to Jesus. But I said, those 5,000 people would not have been fed till this day by Jesus, if that little boy had not done his part. Look, God's waiting on you. He's waiting on you. The next move is yours. And I said to her, that little boy calls God to act, but God does not act. God reacts when we act. I said one time, and she was listening as I was talking, I said the Israelites were thirsty. These same several million Jews were thirsty. And I said, do you know what God did? She said, no. I said, God... God opened up a big rock in a place called Horeb, and water gushed out of that rock. And you know enough water to give, give uh, the prince the thirst permanently for 40 years. Came out of that rock to feed those Jews? Oh, she said, is that right? But I said, you know what had to happen first? Moses had to take his rod and smite that rock. You see, God would not have opened the waters in that rock yet if Moses hadn't smitten that rock with his, with his rod. God is waiting on you. It is your turn, I said. I said, one time a man died and was buried. His name was Lazarus. And Lazarus was in the grave. He had been in there for four days. And his body was already stinking. Some of you bodies stink anyhow. You haven't been in the grave yet. But uh, <laughs> his body was already stinking. And I said, you know what? She said, what? I said, Jesus walked up and raised that fellow from the dead who had been dead for four days. She said he did, and I said he sure did. But I said, you know what? Before he did that, he said to the people, roll the stone away. And Lazarus would have still been in that grave unless they had rolled the stone away. I said, God was saying, I'm waiting on you. The next move is yours. And God always waits until we make our move, and God, in response to our doing what we can do, does what we cannot do, but God will not do what we cannot do until we have done what we can do. I said one time, there was a man. He had leprosy. I mean, he had sores from the top of his head, the ball of his feet, and he had sores. And his name was Naaman. He was a captain, a mighty man. His little servant, maid girl, told him about the man of God. He went down to the man of God, and did you know what the man of God did? She said, what did he do? I said, the man of God, he, God used that man to heal him of his leprosy. But I said, not until Naaman had gone to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times. Now, folks, listen. The, the rod didn't part the Red Sea. And the rod didn't cause the water to come out of the rock in, in Horeb. And the, the rolling the stone away didn't get Lazarus from the dead. And dipping in Jordan didn't get Naaman healed. God fed the 5,000. God parted the Red Sea. God raised Lazarus from the dead. God 
heal Naaman of his leprosy, but God never does what we can do until we have done what we can do. God does not do what, he, what we cannot do. God acts in response to us. And I said, lady, I'll be very frank with you. I said, if you get saved, it'll not be because God gives you a feeling. I said, I have given you the facts, and you provide the faith, then God provides the feeling. I have done my part. God is waiting on you to do your part. And when you do your part, after I've done my part, He'll do His part. And He does it every time. I said, lady, one time, <laughs> there was a city called Jericho. And the people of God were supposed to claim it. But they got to that city, and all around that city, there was a big wall, a giant wall. So big that six horses or ch uh, could 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 walk a prance on top of that wall, and God knocked that wall down so His people could take over the city. But I said before God knocked that wall down, He said to His people, "I want you to march around that city one day. I want you to march around that city two days. I want you to march around that city three days. I want you to march around that city four days. I want you to march around that city five days." I want you to march around that city six days. And on the seventh day, you march around it seven times. And God, what God did, God brought the walls down. But God would not have brought the walls down if they had not walked around that city 13 times in seven days. Now, you listen to me. God wants to use you. But God will not do for you until you do for yourself. God will not do the impossible until you do the possible. God will not do the miraculous until you do that which you can do. And God will not do what you cannot do until you've done what you can do. And if, I said to her, lady, if you die and go to hell, it won't be because God didn't give you a feeling. It is because you did not do the thing necessary to cause God to react and give you a feeling. I told her one time about thousands of people that were bitten by serpents, those Israelites, Snakes came and bit these Jews by the thousands and hundreds of thousands. And they were dying for the thousands. And I told her how that God came to Moses. And God said, Moses, if you'll, if you'll take a piece of brass, and if you'll make that brass into the shape of a serpent, if you'll put that serpent on a pole, that serpent made of brass, and if you'll hold that pole high like that, you tell the Jews that everybody who looks at that serpent of brass on top of that pole will be healed. And I said, do you know, lady, that God healed everybody that looked? But I said, God wouldn't heal those people unless Moses had made a serpent of brass. You see, God raised the dead, but God didn't raise the dead till they rolled the stone away. God parted the Red Sea, but God didn't part the Red Sea until Moses smote the Red Sea with his rod. God gave water from Horeb, the rock in Horeb, but God did not give water until the rock had been smitten. God always thinks of something that we must do before God does what He must do. And I said, now, ma'am, I said, you need salvation. I've done my part, and God is waiting to do His part. Are you going to do your part? Well, she said, I just don't think I've got to do anything but wait till God hits me down, and my time comes, I'll, I'll feel it, I'll know it. I said, ma'am, every single illustration in the Bible about salvation refutes what you're saying. Listen carefully. The Bible likens salvation to eating a meal. Now, when you go home today, you have a big lush meal sitting, sitting there before you. You can starve to death at that table. God prepared the meal, but you're going to have to eat it. God's not going to force that food down you. And I said, salvation is that way. I said, God won't force it down. He's provided salvation, but God will not force it down. I said, secondly, a marriage, a wedding. Yesterday, we had a wedding here. We have one almost every week. And we had a wedding here yesterday afternoon. Now, let, look at me. Pulls out of sin. Roger. I'm trying to think of her name now. First name. Lisa. Roger. Will you have Lisa to your wedded wife? To heaven to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and cherish till death do us part. I do. Lisa, 
Would you have Roger to be your wedded husband? Would you to love heaven whole from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, to heaven to hold and all that kind of stuff from this day forward? Do you so promise? I'm waiting for a feeling. Do you so promise? <laughs> I'll know when my time comes. I look good night at times here. You got that veil on now. You got your gown on. He's even got a tie on. And, uh, and we're all here. Now's the time. I, I, I'll know when the time comes. The time has come. It's here now. All you got to do is say, I do. And let me tell you something. The time has come for you. It's here now. But listen, if she hadn't have said, I do, I'd never said you did. I told our folks about the old Indian ceremony. The chief said, want him, and the, and the squaw said, the uh, brave said, ugh. And the chief said, want him, and the squaw said, ugh. And the chief said, got him. And I would never have said, got him, until she said, want him. She could, listen, she'd be standing there right now. Before I'd have said, I now pronounce you husband and wife. It, when I said, do you, it was her time. I was waiting on her. The next move is hers. And God Almighty has proposed salvation to you. And the next move is yours. And if you wait till you get a feeling before you get saved, you'll die and go to hell someday without ever being saved. God has said, I do. And then I say this morning, would you say I do? When by faith in Christ you say, I do. And God responds to your act of faith. He talks about salvation being like a door. You enter. Doors open. You enter. A drink of water. Here it is. You drink. Receiving a gift. Here it is. You take it. Accepting invitation. Will you come? And, and, and you must accept. And I said, now, lady, look at me carefully. And you look at her carefully while I talk to her. I said, now, lady, God's waiting on you. The next move is yours. I presented the fact. God waits to present the feeling and salvation. But I said God will never do it until you supply the faith. I said, would you right now, as best you know how, bow your head and would you pray this prayer? And through tears, this very wealthy lady bowed her, bowed her head. And she said, dear God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save my soul. I do now receive Jesus as my Savior. And I said, now, if you meant that and you're trusting Him as your Savior now, would you put your hand in mine? And I felt her hand reaching for mine. She got my arm here first and slid, slid down to my hand. And I prayed a prayer of thanksgiving. And then I said, and asked a question. I did my part. Did you do yours? Yes, I did. I did my part. And I said one third question. <laughs> did God do His? And she said, He sure did. He sure did. And I'm talking to people this morning. God's waiting on you. It's up to you. You. Next step is yours. I presented the facts this morning. And God waits now to unload eternal life on you. But God will not raise the dead till the stone is rolled away. And God will not feed the 5,000 till some little boy offers his lunch basket. And God will not part the Red Sea till his man uses the rod and smites it. And God will not give the water gushing from the rock of Horeb until it's smitten by the rod. And God will not heal the leprosy of, of Naaman until he's dipped in Jordan seven times. God says, I'm giving you something you must do before I do what you cannot do. And you cannot save yourself. No way in this world you can save yourself. You can get in this baptist up here till you've got fins, but you can't save yourself. You can drink a communion cup until you're gained 50 pounds, but you can't save yourself. You can do good deeds so you become a saint, but you can't save yourself. Salvation is a supernatural work of Almighty God that only God can do. And God stands waiting and desirous to do it. But He won't do it. But you do your part. God's waiting on you. The next move. 
is yours. Our Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you'd make salvation simple and real to these precious people. And I pray today that numbers of these dear people who shared with us this happy day will do what that lady did on the plane. I pray they'll do their part. I've done mine. I presented the facts. And you wait to do yours. You wait to present salvation and its healing. And now the ball's in the end of the court of the people. I pray today they'll do their part.